Hey guys, welcome to the podcast. Today's guest is Andrew Schockman, who is the CEO of a company called WeanPath. I had actually seen Andrew at the ReFed conference in May in Minnesota. ReFed, for those of you who don't know, is a food waste reduction organization. Uh, they do a great amount of work, and I've talked about them quite a bit, and I've certainly written about them. And it was a great conference, and you know, it was full of lots of people talking and saying interesting and inspiring things. And so, when you're asked to be the cleanup editor, the last speaker of of the conference, the guy who gives the the message before everyone goes home to uh, do interesting things based on what they heard after they're all charged up, it's a tough task. Uh, you don't want to be repetitive. You want to inspire people. You want to catalyze <laughs> action. And Andrew, Andrew delivered. He certainly delivered a really interesting message. And I was sitting there. I'm thinking, this is a great speech. And so that's hard to do. And he'll do a lot better job telling you about it on the podcast because one of the reasons I wanted to bring him on is to kind of talk about his message there. But really is basically asking why we couldn't do more and telling us why we aren't doing enough with regards to food waste reduction and how we could do more by revisiting our assumptions and and, and thinking bigger. And he'll do a lot better job than me encapsulating the message for sure. But that was kind of the gist of it. And Andrew's been in the game for almost a couple of decades I mean, I think Lean Path was founded in 2004, 2005 timeframe, certainly well before the, the current crop or the more recent crop of food waste reduction startups. And they're using a really tech forward approach. They're using machine vision and, and other means, software driven means to help enterprises and organizations figure out how much food they're wasting and and help them point out where the, the points of waste are and help them reduce that. And so we talk about the business and, and how they've evolved over time and the message he presented at refit. So it was a really good conversation and I hope you enjoy it. As always, you can find more spin podcasts at the usual spots, Apple podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and just go to the spoon, Google with the spoon, just type the spoon in your URL bar. You'll find us and head there to get more podcasts. So, all right. Thank you for joining us. Let's get to our conversation with Andrew. All right. Well, I am excited to be here today with Andrew Shackman, the co-founder and CEO of LeanPath. Andrew, we connected or we saw each other across the room maybe a month ago now. Fast, Amazing how fast time flies mm -hmm. at the ReFed conference, which I was really excited to go to in Minnesota. Absolutely. Uh, great to great to see you there. Yeah. And uh, they gave you the unenviable task of giving the very last speech after two, two full days of action-packed insights and thoughtful dialogue but we'll get to that in a bit because i think i want to talk about what you you talked about and because you had some great insights there but i always like to start my podcast um to let people know a little bit about who we're talking to you are the, like as we said the ceo of lean path and if you're at a party making small talk and someone asks you what you do and you just say i work i run a company called lean path how do you describe it to someone yeah, a great question because I have to also make sure I don't scare them because at a party no one wants to be, no one wants to be uh, surveilled yeah. as to their food habits. But um, yeah, so what I explain to people is that Lean Path is focused on food waste prevention, and we take the view that the things people measure are the things that they manage, and the things that they measure are the things that they improve. And yet historically, people have not measured wasted food, and as a result, it's been a blind spot. It's been an area where we uh, repetitively discard food and don't see it and become numb to it. And it's almost the elephant in the room. And so our job at LeanPath is to bring technology to make food waste prevention and measurement everyday practice in the world's kitchens. And we deploy an intervention which is measuring wasted food every day. And what we find is that once we do that, we're able to help shift culture and focus behavior in kitchens so that people become waste aware. And once you start thinking about food waste, you uh, interact with food differently and you value it more and you waste it less. And so at the heart, we're a technology company that is using technology to change culture and behavior. Correct me if I'm wrong. You founded this over a decade ago, which in the world of food waste reduction, like you're one of the the OG members because, you know, there's been a flurry of new companies launching in the past five years or so, t creating technology targeted at corporates and, you know, commercial environments and kitchens to help food waste reduction. But you were pretty early on that on that path. We, yeah, we began, uh, we founded LeanPath in January of 2004. So we're 18 years, a little more than 18 years wow. into the journey. And 
I, I sometimes joke that the, the uh, name of the company is a bit autobiographical in that the first seven or so years were a lean <laughs> path because yeah. people were not paying attention to food waste the way they are now. And um, it's incredibly exciting to see the degree of innovation and um, you know just the energy around the movement. Okay, so that original business plan or you know the idea when you, you, it was you, maybe your first couple employees versus today – like, how has it changed? Was it a completely different thing? Were there some pivots in between there? It's So it's pretty similar in the core of we're going to make technology to measure food waste, but the why has evolved. When we began, we were more focused on the economic loss related mm -hmm. to food waste and recognizing that there was a significant margin impact. And interestingly, at that time, as I recall, menu prices were growing at a slower compounded rate than wholesale food prices. And so people's P&L, their middle of their P&L was getting squished. And we looked at this and said, this looks like a lot of pain. It's a real toothache. We can help with that. And that's where we began. It didn't begin as an environmental uh, sustainability vision. But what we found was we needed to explain to people why this why this mattered. And so we had to teach about food waste and its import and then teach about prevention of food waste and then teach about measurement of food waste and finally automation of food waste measurement. And we spent so much time at that base level of explaining why food waste mattered that we became experts on all of the data around it and frankly were shocked by the environmental impact and the social impact. And once we realized that, our why changed. And it was, even though it was tough going, we said, this is something we can't quit. This is one of the most important issues of our time. It's a nexus issue and we're gonna stick with it until you know we're able to drive change. Okay, so you were talking about it every day and you became a true believer, but you, you had a career before this. I think you were like, a, ran marketing agencies, you were in kind of the advertising world. And you jumped into food waste. Talk about that. Did you want to do something more meaningful? Why did you make this transition? Yeah. So I was working in uh, in uh, internet digital marketing, and I happened to work with a number of food brands, and mm. it was consumer marketing. So we were marketing food to consumers on the internet in the first generation of the internet. So this is uh, my first business. We began in uh, I, I guess 1995. Um, so it was uh, it was very early on. And, uh, but what I found was I, I went through an exercise of trying to write the values uh, of that business. And I found it challenging because we mm -hmm. were selling Cap'n Crunch to children and trying to get their parents to um, buy more of it. We were selling, uh, you, know, you know, instant coffee uh, to people on the internet. We were, it was not, it was not something where I felt like the work was uh, super meaningful, and it didn't feel like we were changing the world mm. in any way. And so uh, there were a bunch of things that happened in that first generation of the internet, but uh, let's just say a lot of things went boom, and then I had a chance to be contemplative about what I yeah. wanted to do next. And I said, I want to do a product, not a service. I want to do something that solves a real toothache. I want to do something that has meaning, something that's resilient through economic cycles. And sort of all those things from being a first generation dot com entrepreneur. Um, I sort of focused into what I want to do next and and be different. And so um, I feel like I'm still atoning for the um, for the Captain <laughs> Crunch and the uh, instant coffee sales that I was involved in. And uh, hopefully I'm I'm chipping away at that obligation of uh, debt to society that I need to pay back. You know, a lot of us took a pandemic, took a pandemic for a lot of us to have what I described as our uh, Shawshank Redemption, get busy living or get busy dying moments. Like I feel like everyone collectively said we better – do the thing we want to do, uh, the world's not so certain. But you had that that moment like 15 years before a pandemic. Yeah, well, there's something really kind of painful about being a, I think I was a 29-year-old former dot-com CEO and finding that there was literally no employment market for that profile. That, uh, <laughs> that you know, that was, that was you were in a, in a sort of hinterland um, where you didn't fit and needing to really reflect at that moment about what mattered to me. And um, and concluding that um, I like to build things and I like to connect with people and I like to learn new things and um, and and but it's got to have meaning and uh, and so been fortunate with Lean Path. I, every day I get up and I feel 
um, the work we're doing is incredibly important, and I'm proud to do it with a terrific team. I've seen the transition of a lot of people come over from the traditional internet, traditional technology world, IoT, in the last half decade to decade to do something in food. Food waste prevention is one of them. But I think, you know, your length of stay as the head of this company is kind of a testament to the fact that like, you find a little bit more meaning. If you just look at a lot of the serial entrepreneurs, okay, building the new social media thing or now maybe Web3 or whatever, like a lot of these guys will found something, sell it, wash, rinse, repeat. But like staying 15 years at a company, I think is a testament to like, there's maybe some meaning here for you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm deeply committed to our mission and it's, um, I mean, this is important. This is, this is a huge nexus issue and it needs a ton of work done on it. And, uh, and, and also I think there's been a reinvention that has occurred every five years or so in our business. So I don't really even feel like I'm in the same company in many ways that we began in 2004. Uh, you know, we now have customers in 40 countries and we have an office in China and an office in, in the UK and in addition mm -hmm. to our footprint in the US and the, just the journey of learning about food waste in many different cultures and the business context shifting and uh, the challenge of of um, solving those problems, you know, for me that puzzle, you know, I, I my one of my you know things I've reflected on is my life purpose, and it's to solve consequential puzzles that make a difference for the people I love and uh, my community. And so this has been a consequential puzzle, Mike, that I have been uh, working on from every angle for a long time. Before we get into your talk and some of the themes there, I do want to just dive a little bit deeper on the Lean Path technology so so people have a better understanding what you what you've built so you are measuring food waste reduction you're helping them measure that so, so they can make differences see what where they're wasting food what is that technology and 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 what's the service so yeah so there's three pieces to it there's there's tracking of wasted food um, what we think of as metrology so putting mm -hmm. uh, iot systems into kitchens so scales cameras uh, touchscreen interfaces that are used to record both pre-consumer and post-consumer food waste. Uh, so hmm. um, before you throw away a full pan of lasagna that you made too much of, you set it on a lean path scale and you tell us why you made too much of it. You know, I overproduced it or, you know, I, I uh, over merchandised or whatever it might be. And we then store that data. And uh, in some cases, we do that with AI in image recognition. And in other cases, we do it with uh, people telling us what it is. And then that data uh, goes up into the cloud and we have the second part of our solution, which is analytics around understanding and discovering what the trends are in what you're wasting. Because mm -hmm. as we spoke about earlier, this is the elephant in the room that's unseen and people often haven't reflected on it. And so when you start to put the patterns together, people realize, wow, there are some really significant opportunities that are literally low hanging fruit. And the third piece of what we do is what we, we think of as driving action based on the information that's in our hands. And this is actually surfacing opportunities, the technology making recommendations, and then the, the, or the client who we're working with, the chef, will decide if they wanna take those recommendations and work on them. And if they do, then we provide regular reinforcement related to their progress in those specific objectives that they're working on. And so it's tracking, it's discovery, and it's driving uh, outcomes. And all through a culinary lens, um, our point of view is no one comes to work wanting to waste food. Everybody wants to do the right thing. They value food. That's why you go into mm -hmm. you know, the food business. You, you think food's great, typically. And so our job is to help them be uh, have eyes in the back of their head, 24 hours a day visibility on their operation to be able to understand the behaviors that are leading to waste. And just one other thought, there's a great Buckminster Fuller quote that I love, uh, which is, if you want to change the way a person thinks, don't bother. Instead, give them a tool. And through the use of that tool, it will change how they think and how they work. And That's so great. a lot of what we do is we there's a theater of the kitchen. We put a system to measure in the kitchen. And as soon as people start to realize, wow, they care about food waste and I need to measure it, they begin to change their behavior even before the data comes out of the system. Because 
it's clearly a priority and now I'm confronted with this reality of what am I putting in the garbage and suddenly the elephant is no longer hidden in the room and in fact what the frontline team learns is that they are the global change makers on this issue that the way we're going to solve food waste is through the teams that are working at the front line in kitchens mm -hmm. who often don't get anywhere near the respect that they are they are owed and deserve based on the hard work that they put in. And this is a chance for them to be those change agents. Okay. And the typical customer is, are you selling to individual chefs, restaurant chains, food service companies? Our customers are tend to be multinational food service companies, okay. um, typically in uh, non-commercial environments, so healthcare, higher ed, colleges. Uh, at schools, uh, corporate dining, uh, senior living, uh, but also hotels, casinos, uh, cruise ships, military bases, uh, enter, you know, uh, sports arenas, all of that. Do you have restaurant chains or customers? Why uh, more non pro or I guess non commercial? So we've done, we have done, we have done some some restaurants, but the heart of our business is is in non commercial, and the reason for that is I I break the world down into the degree of sensitivity that these operations have to overproduction. And uh, if you have uh, menus that change every day, typically because you have the same customers, um, you never get a chance to practice that menu and you can't reuse everything mm. that you made today, tomorrow. So you think can think of the world as restaurants that have the same menu and different customers versus non-commercials that have different menus and the same customers, right? In a college dining hall or a corporate environment, you know, the same customers every day. And so the people in that latter camp have much more change in what they're managing. And so it's harder to get the production dialed right in and to absorb errors or misses. And so as a result of that, you have this high volume production, bulk production, mm -hmm. commissary style in advance of service, prepared not cooked to order, but in bulk versus a restaurant that's cooking to order in response to an individual order yeah. with a menu they know well. A cafeteria or a casino serving its employees are making different items every day. They haven't dialed it in what, oh, this is how much we make. So there probably is a lot more food waste than uh, those where you're, it's direct, I'm ordering off a, me, a menu and like you're just re responding to that. Right. If you're making eight items on your menu, you have a lot more knowledge about exactly how those will be accepted yeah. by your customers by day, you know, day of the week, by minute of the day, you you know how that's going to be absorbed. Whereas if you're running you know, cycle menu in a corporate dining hall and today's menu's never been served before or not more often than once every month, mm -hmm. it's uh, it's much tougher. I've been at uh, Vegas events. I've actually ran events in Vegas and mm -hmm. the amount of food waste in that town just boggles my mind. And, and I, I believe that they actually can't actually take on any of that food if it's been on a line, even if it's barely been touched and then put, take it to food shelters, et cetera. I think it's like against the law. So I, I'm always like, I always feel slightly guilty when I'm in Vegas, quite honestly. Well, I think, well, I think for many reasons, people feel slightly guilty <laughs> yeah. when they're in Vegas, I guess. But you know what's funny, actually, the very first hotel that we ever worked in at Lean Path was the MGM Grand, huh. which I think at the time was the largest you know, hotel in the U.S. And talk about like a scary place to cut your teeth, right? This was not the the local, uh, yeah. you know, Hilton. This was like this immense operation. And over the years, we've done a ton of work in, in Las Vegas and in, in casinos in different environments. And, you know, what I would say is they, they all have the challenge of buffets and they all have the challenge of employee dining rooms, which also are, you know, very much like buffets because they have such large workforces who eat on site. And there's tons of opportunity to address overproduction. You were the last final speaker at the Refit Conference, and I found your talk very inspiring. And I thought the message was really interesting. You talked about really, I think, how um, there's a lot of people who have good intentions in the world of food. And a lot of people focus on food waste reduction that have good intentions. But oftentimes, despite all of that, you know, we're not making quite the impact we can. You know, we're, we're, our beliefs are limited, et cetera. And I've, I've probably done a horrible job summarizing your talk, but like characterize what you, what you spoke about. And then we can kind sure. of dive into it. So I was really honored to be able to speak at, at an event, um, which is, I think, incredibly important. What Refed's doing and getting hundreds of people together who are the change makers on food waste at an organizational level. That is a terrific community to be part of and to be able to sort of reflect at the end 
I, you know, I wanted to really share something with these uh, change makers that I thought would be helpful. And what we all want is big change, fast change, uh, really impactful change. And so the question becomes, what are the obstacles that we might run into as we go and pursue these things? And so, you know, I've reflected on it and I've reflected on the fact that while there is a lot of work happening on food waste, it's still not nearly as big a movement as it should be given the scale of the problem. And the work that we're doing is still pretty darn hard. Like it's harder work, you know, it's rolling a rock up a hill and given the importance of the issue, it's too hard. And so why is that? And I've really reflected on what are the things that are needed to really enact big change and fast change and impactful change. And what I concluded is, as I've thought about this and reflected on it, that um, we're often operating at, with limiting beliefs, um, many times unconsciously, about the work that we're doing on wasted food. And because this is a very operationally intensive activity, right, we're getting into changing the way people work, we tend to prioritize the near-term risks, uh, you know, operational day-to-day -day management worries, um, all the impediments to why we can't change things, as opposed to really fully appreciating the true risks, which are climate change, food insecurity, loss of biodiversity, land conversion. These are the things that really matter in the grand scheme of things. And so we can't optimize for the present. And yet what I see is many times as people try to enact change, they end up setting targets and goals and, um, and initiatives that are smaller, safer bets than they really should be because they're really optimized around those near-term risks. And so that's what I was sharing with the refed audience. And I was also sharing just my own journey of why is that? And I talked a little bit about going into kitchens early on when I was a novice at this. And, um, and I was learning from the chefs I was talking to and sharing all of the, um, you know, initially kind of blindness to food waste that I ran into at the chef level mm -hmm. and, and almost an unwillingness to engage around the issue at times. And yet I would go talk to a pot washer and they got it, like totally yeah. understood it. And I was like, why is it that the chef and the manager don't get what the pot washer sees so clearly? Yeah. And it was because the pot washer saw that, you know, food insecurity was a problem in his community yeah. and that that was the real risk rather than, you know, what was on, you know, where that we might run out of one item today on the menu. You know, if you're, t if you're someone who's running operations, you're running a kitchen, it's, it's kind of a fog of war situation where, you know, they're, they're oftentimes just trying to survive. They probably don't get paid enough. And so we can all kind of sympathize with why oftentimes they're not focused on the big picture. Cause it, it, food waste seems one of those areas where like it's, it's aligned pretty well with like the profitability and the bottom line, right? Like if you waste less food, you're saving money for the company. Um, it, it's pretty easy to kind of, to a certain degree, make those line up. But what you're saying is, um, despite lining those uh, objectives up, they do align pretty well. We need people to think bigger. So I'm just wondering how you do that um, when, yeah. when people are just trying to like fight through their day to day. Yeah. So I think, I think we do need to think bigger and we need to start with empathy. And mm -hmm. to your point about fog of war, like, you know, one of the things I first learned in doing this business was that I thought about making progress in terms of what I did this quarter in my business. And yet every person I was working with had a chance to get fired three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, mm -hmm. right? Like it is, a, it is now, it is right now. It's not three months from now. It's like this moment we have to, we have to be excellent. So I have huge empathy and I think you have to start with that empathy, but then you need to, to challenge people to go farther uh, and, and, and do more and not allow their beliefs about what they must do to stop stop them. And so I think there's a, you know, if you take a look, for example, like this classic um, classic one that we see is that the first customer through a buffet needs to have the exact same choices that the last customer sees. So you never want to have a degraded experience at the end of a buffet. And that's like dogma in some ways, like you have to do it this way. And so that's drilled into chefs and they think they need to. And you end up with full buffets at the end of service for that one last customer who's going to walk <laughs> through and be able to pick from food for 100. And if you step back and go, hang on, like what if we actually didn't have a pan of scrambled eggs out at the end of breakfast, getting old, getting cold, or just getting quality's not great? What if we offered cook to order eggs for the last customer? Like that would be an awesome experience for the customer. It would save you money. 
it would create all the choice that you want to have. And so those kinds of things, it's more like just being intolerant of waste and creating a forcing function where you go, how can we solve this in a different way? Because mm -hmm. people are basically solving other business problems by wasting food. They're solving merchandising problems. They're worried about running out. And mm -hmm. the reality is you can solve those problems in different ways. And so it's not that it doesn't align, you know, Mike, with the bottom line, because it does. Yeah. But it's more like if you've been doing something the same way for so long and you perceive risk in your business and you're solving that risk with waste by never running out and never not having enough merchandised and all of those things, it's really hard to shift gears and go, wow, I could actually unlock savings by doing it differently. And so it's really just me standing there and being a bit of a, a nag and kind of and, and collectively lean path, like prompting them to go, hey, look at this with fresh eyes, bring a curious mind to this. Mm. Couldn't we do it differently? So the experience for the customer stays intact and may actually be even elevated. Yeah. If we get beyond kind of this theater of artificial choice of having a full buffet for the last person, or even the last like 40 people, the stragglers, the people that woke up, wait, maybe we should just penalize them for sleeping in. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm just I I'm, I'm not for any penalties. I want all customers <laughs> to be treated in a happy way. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, they should, they, they should have choice and they should have a great experience, but it doesn't need to be delivered in the exact same way the first customer experienced it. You know, in the same way that the grocery store, like, you know, for so long a time, it still is to a certain degree, the dogma of the produce aisle. Like you have to have beautiful, fresh produce, not ugly produce in the produce yeah. aisle. Uh, I think that the grocery industry is starting to come try to reckon with that a little bit. There's been some options for them to maybe vary it up and also uh, take some of the less fresh produce and, and find a market for. It. But there's these dogmas across every theater of the food industry, every different distribution point. Yes, exactly. And that was kind of my point to the refed audience was go look in your area and ask yourself the question, is there is there a limiting belief in my area? Could I do this differently? And, and not just in the food operations, but also in the corporate offices where people are establishing programs to work on food waste. Like, are we setting ambitious enough programs? Are we doing things at scale? Are we bringing burdens of proof that are too excessive to things that are innovative? Mm -hmm. And we're saying if it's not 100% certain, it's not worth scaling. You know, those kinds of uh, trade-offs, we need to challenge ourselves to take risks uh, to scale things that were, you know, are proven, but maybe not, you know, without, they're not completely risk-free. And, you know, we need to make sure we're assessing our, our performance properly, looking at the holistic bo triple bottom line, variety of things like that. I think there there's room for, for us to just push ourselves throughout food service, food retail, yeah. food distribution, ag, manufacturing, all of it. Yeah, I would imagine you find some receptive voices in food service management in some of these large companies that have established themselves as leaders where there's a mission, you know, the, the Michael Bacher, Googles of the world, you know, Microsoft, mm -hmm. uh, some of these companies, Adobe, some of these companies have kind of made it a point, like we want to be good corporate citizens and lead by example and hopefully like show some of the other corporates the way to go. And I imagine you're finding maybe some, some receptivity, receptivity there. Oh yeah, for sure. There, there are, there are a bunch of people who I think are are innovating in the in the corporate world, uh, and it's um, and I think generally the fluency with this issue is increasing. And yeah. it used to be the case in our business, for example, that we had a technology, but our customers didn't have a business strategy for food waste, and so we would have to sort of provide this kind of almost free consulting layer where we would come in and build their food waste strategy for them so they could understand how they could affect change using our, our technology. And so we have this whole sort of like consulting business inside LeanPath that's not really our, um, our long-term core because we believe our customers are building those muscles. And increasingly I'm seeing that where things that we used to do for them, they now have teams that are focused yeah. on food waste and they're doing the work. You probably have some cohort, you probably have, have developed some, I guess, archetypes and kind of you have these off the shelf packages after 10 years of doing this, or 15 years of doing this, where you, they largely fit both the competency is growing inside these organizations, but also you just have these packages of solutions that you probably can provide. 
Yeah, I mean, we have very well-defined interventions that we know work. And so the experimentation requirements are fewer. However, I would say so much of this is about buy-in. And every yeah. every corporate culture, every kitchen culture has its own sets of issues to obtain buy-in and, and also culturally. So I mentioned earlier, we work in so many different countries and the relationship to food and food waste is different. And so mm. trying to find the right way to deliver those interventions is, is, a, is an interesting journey. Every time I have a conversation with someone in food waste, I do like to challenge them and bring up the, 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 the conversation of the end consumer Mm-hmm. Because, you know, you could talk to, you know, the folks in Vegas and corporate corporate food management as long as you want. But, like, by and large, consumers are, are, like, the hardest part of the equation. They're stubborn. And I'm always surprised at how little innovation is happening in the consumer space and in the, in the home around food waste reduction. And I oftentimes think, like, the industry kind of has given up to a certain degree because, like, it's really hard. Like, from a technology perspective, coming up with the miracle gadget or the system for food waste reduction in the home is, like, it's almost impossible. So we've kind of said, okay, let's focus on messaging and behavior change, which is maybe that's the way to go. Um, certainly like, but I think like it's a combination of things we need to think about. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, I love the I love the question, and it's it is hard, I, it, particularly the tech interventions in the home. So if you look at sort of the the whole sort of personal measurement space, right? It works well for. Um, for fitness and, you know, tracking your running and your walking and your weight. But whenever you try to get to questions of tracking food just for diet, that becomes an immensely more difficult problem to get compliance and traction with. And so I know that the intervention that would cause people to have awareness is measuring wasted food and understanding what it's costing them and being able to put it in their family budget and go, wow, we actually are wasting $500 a month. We don't have $500 a month to waste. But to get to that point where you've got that quantification requires more work than a consumer is willing to undertake. So the closest thing that I've seen on the gadget side of things has been some of the patents that you see coming out of the big retailers like Amazon and Walmart looking at uh, self-scanning bins that track UPC codes as they or codes just as they go in to the bin for purposes of auto replenishment. And so ironically, that's all about accelerating consumption um, and they have a motivation to do that. Uh, But it may also be the way that we learn what we're wasting. And so I think you've got to end up with somebody being willing to foot the bill for a piece of technology that that where there's enough value in tracking what's mm-hmm. going in the bin. And so far, the people who have that incentive are the people who want to sell you more stuff. And uh, of course, scanning things is one thing, trying to know what food you threw away, much harder. And so uh, so I think it's a tough problem. And um, I, I do think that the smart fridge solution, which has been promised now, right, Mike, for probably <laughs> like 25 years or 30 years, I've been yeah. hearing about smart fridges. And I mean, back to my internet days, I was hearing about smart fridges. Yeah. And I've written about every one of them, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I know you probably have. And the, um, the, the thing I would love to see is, is a refrigerator that's designed after someone read Dana Gunder's book on you know, the waste-free kitchen handbook. And start with that, where you have a bin for things you should eat today. And just put that front and center in your fridge. Like that, to me, that's a simple behavioral nudge that could get people if you could just get them through a behavior of once a day, just stick stuff in that box and, and, and see it. It's visual. It's there for you. Mm-hmm. Um, I think those kinds of things of how we organize the inside of our fridge probably has more value than the uh, touch surface on the outside. Yeah. I mean, I say this over and over, but the fridge is basically the same thing it was when I was growing up. And my parents' generation is like this big, untransparent box of, of food where things get pushed to the back and get yep. wasted. I think I think the appliance makers maybe have some motivation more so than like Amazon, which wants to sell you a bunch of fresh food. But so, you know, I think the Samsungs and the LGs and the Whirlpools are trying. It's just uh, the corporate cultures there are fairly conservative and they have. And quite honestly, what really sells is is great looking design that looks good in a kitchen, right. which is oftentimes not aligned with like food waste reduction. I think one lever that is going to be pulled more and more is just the, the cost of food. I think um, 
consumers will be more aware of this just because they're paying so much more for ground beef and, and, yeah. and produce. Yeah, I mean, when you think about what the share of wallet is now in the U.S. or most developed economies, what we pay to eat is such a small part of our total uh, spend that we are pretty um, unaware, right, of of some of these, uh, you know, the costs from waste. But as you either quantify it all in one place and can see the elephant, or as inflation kicks in and you can't afford to ignore the pieces that might otherwise have seemed de minimis, now they seem like, wow, material. Um, I think that is like one silver lining to this really um, unfortunate economic circumstance we have right now. But food inflation definitely increases pain around food waste. And hopefully, you know, there's this there's this quote from, you know, sort of the the theoretical CFO who says, never let a good crisis go to waste. And I I would say (laughs) in this moment, the food waste movement should not let this crisis go to waste. How can we shift behavior in a more sustained um, structural way? Lunchflation is a thing that we're that uh, I think people are grappling with. And maybe they're going to bring they're going to pack up their lunch instead of eating eating out. So, yep. Absolutely. So, uh, Andrew, this has been a great conversation. Like I said, I enjoyed it. Uh, uh, you sang the praises of Dana Gunders and Refed, Refed and they, they did a great job. And one of the smart choices they made was to invite you to speak. And I would encourage everyone to, to check out you know, Refed, but also check out LeanPath's website. Where can they find out more about you and your, what you're working on? At LeanPath.com. That's pretty easy. You're early enough to get your .com address. That's how early you were. That's right. And I would encourage people, by the way, we have a blog called the Food Waste Prevention Blog, and it's not promotional. It is about the issues that we see and deal with and, you know, learnings and insights from our chefs and, you know, our clients. And if you're interested in food waste prevention and food service, I think it's an important read. I feel like you were early enough to get the leanpath.com website before all the lean on the lean entrepreneur movement kicked in, I think around 2008, 2009, that they probably wanted that web address. <laughs> yeah. We, we were, we just got in right before, right before the window closed. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Andrew. Thanks a lot. Thanks Mike. So that's it for today's show. Thank you to Andrew Shockman of lean path for coming on the show. As always, the spoon podcast is hosted and produced by me, Michael Wolf. The podcast is a part of the spoon media network. And if you'd like to connect with us, just head over to The Spoon, you know where we are, or drop us a line at podcast at thespoon.tech. And if you haven't already given us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please do so. It's really helpful for us. And finally, we are getting together in person in Seattle in November at the just announced Food Tech Leaders Forum. We'll be getting together with the people you listen to on the podcast leading the food tech revolution. So if you want to connect with a lot of these folks that are on the show, Please come in November, November 3rd. You can find out more by heading over to The Spoon and going to our events page. All right, everyone, that's it for now. We'll talk to you next week.